Hi, Catherine. Thank you so much for joining me today. You're welcome. It's so nice to meet you. Do you mind introducing yourself? Not at all. Um, I'm Catherine McLaughlin, and I've been a sexuality educator and trainer for over 25 years. And my specialty is focused on uh, people with developmental disabilities, intellectual disabilities, and sexuality. How did you come to be doing what you're doing? Right. Um, <clears throat> so it started really, um, well, a couple, a couple things happened. One, I was working for Planned Parenthood. Um, and doing lots of workshops um, for the general population. And people started to reach out to me, you know, special educators, developmental disability agencies, you know, looking for help, you know, how do I address this? Um, so I started teaching individuals and also leading staff trainings and parent workshops on how to talk to your kids about sexuality. Um, so I did all of, I started doing all that work, but also right around that same time, I um, had a, an accident and became, I had a spinal cord injury and became a wheelchair user. Wow. So, yeah. So I think both of those things at the same time, I was really interested in, you know, all of a sudden people were treating me really differently and I was the exact same person, right? So I was like, what, what's all this about? So I was just really interested personally and professionally in sexuality and disability. Wow. But yeah. you don't have anyone in your family with an intellectual disability or developmental disability? I don't, I don't. That is really fascinating. I don't, I'm always fascinated by people who, who kind of get into this right. world and they don't have yeah. this personal like connection well, but you know it's interesting though I think uh, my mom was a school teacher and she did a lot of work um, training teachers to work with kids with developmental disabilities um, and we had a boy in the neighborhood who I played with you know so I think it was you know that message was just like everybody else you know why wouldn't you you know work with this group and so I think some of that came through probably from my mom you know um so I wasn't afraid of the population or, you know, I was like, oh, wow, this is great. I'd love to work with them. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's one thing that, that really struck me about Elevate Us is, um, you know, I, I think I told you before, well, in my initial email to you is that one of the reasons why I started um, shifting the, the focus of my blog to disability was because after I had my daughter, um, it was so important for me to, to try and, and do some type of education work or something to, um, to help protect people with intellectual developmental disabilities with regards to, um, to sex education and, um, and awareness and so forth and prevent um, abuse. Yeah. And but then every time I started getting into this, I, I just got really triggered, you know, by, by my own history of, of sexual abuse. And it was just um, very difficult for me to dive into. But when I finally felt ready to, and I started doing a little bit of research online and I came upon your trainings and I was just astonished at your tone because it's so rare to see that, that, that thread of, um, empowerment and self-sufficiency with practicality and um and very resourceful it's just it's it's very um it just has a tone that really resonates with me and like i said it's, it's very rare it's not um mm -hmm. you're, you're not talking about the special happy smiley people you know you're talking about real people who have sexual needs and 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 desires and so forth and that um that we need to um, address specifically. I, I was wondering in that thread, like what types of trainings do you do? Like who do you train? How do you do it? Do you work with a team? How, how, do, you, how do you do the trainings to now, like with, with COVID and so forth? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> the trainings that we do, uh, you know, I do, I do a mix. So sometimes we host trainings. You probably saw some of that on the website. So we have a three-day become a sexuality educator and trainer uh, training. And that is mostly professionals. Some parents 
Um, but usually the parents also have a professional role as well. Um, and then sometimes self-advocates will come to that training, um, but primarily professionals, I would say. And the hope is that they'll go back to their agency, their community, and lead sexuality education classes, parent workshops, and staff training so that you know, people with disabilities are receiving the information from lots of different ways, right? So classes with peers, um, professionals talking and supporting them, and then parents also talking and supporting them. Um, so they're getting a lot of information, um, hopefully. And um, <clears throat> the thing, when I first started the work too, there, there weren't a lot of curriculum. You know, there were some older curriculum available. And um, so I started working with Green Mountain Self Advocates. So it's a group of people with disabilities in Vermont. And um, they, it, was, it was a really an aha moment for me where I had been an educator for years. So I thought, oh, well, I'll, you know, I'll write the curriculum and then I'll teach it and you know, I'll do what I always do, right? And they were like, no, no, nothing about us without us. We wanna help write the curriculum. And not only do we want to help write the curriculum, we also want to be one of the teachers of the curriculum as well. So I think, you know, some of the tone you're talking about comes from me and all that, but also from people with disabilities really speaking up and saying, no, you know, we want to be part of this. We have yeah. things to say about this and we want to be the teachers. So the curriculum was um, I worked on it with Green Mountain Self Advocates. They reviewed all the lessons. And then um, it was designed for team teaching. So a self-advocate and a professional team were leading the sexuality education classes. So that, um, that's where it all started 20 years ago or so. Um, and now I'm doing, so not only do I do the three day, but I am doing work directly with self-advocates and training them to be sexuality educators. So I just did a, like a three-year project with Michigan and we trained 25 teams, a self-advocate and a professional teams, and they cover most of the state of Michigan. So no matter where you live, you can get access to sexuality education classes that are uh, positive, inclusive, um, effective, and one of the teachers is a person with a disability. Wow. Yeah. I don't want to get all teary, but like this, this Aww. really makes me want to cry. It's so Aww. amazing and wonderful and needed. I mean, yes, it is so needed. So needed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. we don't have anything like that here in Hawaii. Nothing like that. Like we really need something like this. There's, there's yeah. no, no sexuality education for people with intellectual developmental disabilities. Well, it's interesting. With any across yeah. the whole disability spectrum. That's right. We had, um, one, I think we've had one participant from um, Hawaii uh, at the three day. And uh -huh. I did, st I had a meeting with the self-advocacy group um, with the Developmental Disability Council. And we talked about this project and getting self-advocates to be trained as sexuality educators. There's definitely interest. And then um, the woman who I had met End up leaving, ended up leaving the DD council. So I don't really know what happened with it, but people have been trying to get things yeah. going. Yeah. Well, I'll have to chat more specifically with you after this, but yeah. I just, it's amazing. I just, it's absolutely thrilling that you're, wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, so and now I'm, most of my work is done online now, um, yeah. you know, like many people. Um, but I, you know, I, I am doing a class right now with self advocates. We're going through the whole curriculum online. Um, you know, it's fine, but it's not ideal. You know, it's not ideal. I think the staff training, you know, professional trainings, parent workshops, I think those are all right online. You know, I mean, I think people kind of appreciate the convenience, <laughs> you know, they're kind of lonely. It's nice to be with a group of people, you know. Um, and self-advocates, it's working. I would much rather be in person with them, but you know, what are you gonna do? So we're yeah. still offering that class. Um, but it's, I think if anything, it's harder on the teacher because it's just hard to make sure people are, you know, got the right handout and everything, you know, just sort of being in the room and being able to read the room is 
not e easy online, um, but we're yeah. doing all our trainings online now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was kind of excited about, about that because it was like, oh, now I have a chance of going to one, you know? <laughs> exactly. Well, I think, you know, you don't have to travel and yeah. It. Um, yeah. yeah, it'd be great to have you come to one of the three day, then you could teach classes and, you know, yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty fun. So uh, I had, I had um, some questions about common issues that you might see um, in your trainings in your field, either, either through people who participate in the trainings or just in general and working with, with, um, with sex education. Yeah. Um, so do you mean um, like uh, in, I, I'm just, going back a little bit. So is the, you're wondering about issues for people with disabilities specifically, or just kind of overall, what am I seeing kind of? Kind of overall, I think. Yeah, yeah. So um, <clears throat> I get the pleasure of getting people to come to my trainings that are like yourself, you know, right on board, right, ready to go, can't wait. Um, and so I really feel like I, I get the easy job, right? I get to get the people that are ready and psyched. Um, but I think what I hear a lot, and I do do uh, in-service trainings as well, that there's that people with disabilities want the want and need the information, um, and that the barriers tend to be more uh, staff and parents that are afraid. You know, I'm very fearful and I understand, you know, like you said, the sexual abuse. And so there's a lot of worry. Um, and so, and I think there's also some myths out there as well. Um, but that seems to be the barrier is helping um, parents and professionals um, realize the importance of it. And yeah, it's a little scary and yeah, it can be uncomfortable and yeah, you might get some pushback, but that's making us really com comfortable not doing it. But the impact of not teaching it is just so um, horrific that, you know, we've got to get through that discomfort and push through. Micah. Okay, we're all in the same room. Oh, yeah. Okay. No, I completely agree with you. And that was actually what I was really wanting to ask, but I didn't want to. Um, flush out something that might not that you might not see um but i would imagine parents would be a major a major barrier um like well i and i i see a lot of this in the down syndrome community which is why i was wondering too if you if you've seen parents um kind of pushing at the idea that their kids are sexual beings you know or that um might um want to have sex someday and I, like in the Down syndrome parent groups, it seems like there's a lot of people who um, are resistant to, to that. Yeah, well, I think that, you know, we, there's sort of these ideas that people with disabilities aren't sexual, right? And so they don't need this. Um, I think also seeing them as childlike and not adult. Yeah. You know? yeah. So, um, you know, many times I'll hear parents say, yeah, yeah, my son is 21, but he has a cognitive age of, six or something like that. Yeah. And I think there's a sort of misinformation that, oh, then you just teach him what six-year-olds need. But what you have to do is teach him what every 21-year-old needs, how you teach it's different uh, based on his cognitive ability, but not what you teach. So I think that's, you know, sort of sh getting that, shifting that thought like, oh, okay. Um, so I think that's one. The other one that I find with parents is this belief that if I talk about it, it'll give them ideas and then they'll do it, you know? So just don't talk about it, you know? That's the way to, you know, protect them. And um, that's actually not true at all, right? <laughs> and, um, we know that parent-child communication around this is, a, is protective. Um, they can go to their parent if they have questions or anything. Um, and, and research also shows that parents who talk to their kids, not specifically with developmental disabilities, but the general population, if you talk to your kids, they're more likely to wait 
to have sex. Mm -hmm. And if they do, more likely to use protection because it's, you know, you're talking about it, right? Um, but I think that's a myth. Like, I don't want to give them any ideas. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't want to open that can of worms. And, um, you know, but I think it's, it's really comes from fear. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times that when I'm working with parents who I, you know, feel resistant, um, I ask about what, what worries them about this, you know, to really kind of understand what's underneath their fear about it. And we live in a culture that doesn't talk about it anyway with anybody, right? So it's like a double whammy for um, people with disabilities. You know, we don't talk about it in our culture and then we definitely don't talk about it with people with disabilities. Um, and I think just when you talk about sort of the overall, I think some of the things that I've noticed with people with disabilities that I'm always just so, um, it's just, it feels like it's kind of the root of everything is their lack of autonomy and um, body, body autonomy as well and life autonomy. And so how do you teach young people with disabilities that their body is their own and they get to decide what's right for them? And I mean, I, I just, I feel like that I, with the adults I'm working with, I have to say that over and over and over again. And we do this name tag game where you have to, you can put it on this side or this side. And then I put pressure on them to move it and they always move it. And I'm saying, no, no, it's your body. You get to decide, right? So now we're about 10 weeks into the class. They're starting to say, no, I'm not going to move it. It's my body. I get to decide, but it's taken, you know, 10 weeks to say, you get to decide it's your body it's your life it's your mind um and you get to decide what's right for you and that's it's just to me it's just devastating that adults don't feel that way i mean i mean sometimes i have to remind myself too you know it's my body i get you know um but so that that when you said sort of overview of what comes up that's one that i i'm just always you know, they're taught to comply and we want to teach them non-compliance. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I'm trying not to cry right now. That's, oh, that's all right. Cry away. Yeah. It's, yeah. No, but it, it's so, so true. So true. Yeah. So, so true. This compliance piece. Um, how long, so for your trainings, how long are your trainings? Can you talk a little bit about the different kinds of trainings that you have, like for, for people who are likely to be watching this video or reading this post, they're, they're probably going to be parents or self-advocates. How, what are your trainings like for those populations? Yeah. So I usually do um, a general one for parents, an hour and a half, maybe two hours how to talk to your kids about sexuality. So it's, you know, we talk about the messages we got growing up about sexuality, um, which are usually weren't positive, right? And, um, and we do a, a bunch on what gets in the way of talking to your kids and then um, human sexual development. And then I give them lots of tools, like how do you answer questions? How do you respond to sexual behaviors? And so it's very um, skill-based, practical, like I think you said the website is practical. Um, and so that's, that's the parent one. We also have that one available for parents online, like a self-study course. So um, sometimes agencies will buy it and then give it to all their parents, give the link to all their parents so they can take it you know, on, they can do a module, you know, a week or whatever. So we have that. Really? As well. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, and I think actually, you know, parent programs online just really work for parents now. I mean, not, not just the self-study one, but the regular general live training. Um, you know, you just turn on your computer and you didn't have to travel and, um, you know, it's just easier for parents in a lot of ways. So that's primarily what I do for parents. Um, and uh, for self-advocates, it really, it varies. Um, you know, I'll get a request to go to an autism support group or something. And now that everything's online, I do a lot more with self-advocates mm -hmm. because before I wouldn't travel for an hour and a half, you know, to 
Denver, right? So now I'm doing a lot more self-advocate um, training. So um, just requests here and there. I also um, have worked with Project Search. Are you familiar with Project Search? No. So it's a competitive, in, integrated competitive employment training program for people with intellectual disabilities. Mm. Um, I don't know if they have any programs in Hawaii or not, um, but they have many all over the country. And what they found was people with disabilities. So they come, so for example, we have one in, in Keene, New Hampshire, where I am, mm -hmm. and it's a local hospital. And so you become an intern. So you go to the hospital every morning at you know, nine o'clock or whatever, and you have class all morning. And it's all about being an employee and learning all about um, you know, just being a good worker. And then you do a job in the afternoon um, in the hospital. So you might deliver the mail or you might work in the, um, you know, I, don't, I don't know what the departments are called, but you might work in the, I forget what it's called, environmental services, I think is like cleaning and that kind of thing. Like you learn, you do different rotations and you're learning about being a, an employee. And what they found at Project Search were people were losing their jobs, not because they couldn't do the cleaning or deliver the mail, but because they, had, they didn't understand work relationships and how do you interact with people at work. And so they might hug their coworkers or they might follow a coworker around because they have a crush on them or um, and so what they realized was they that the the interns needed help understanding the different kinds of relationships and what topics you talk about with which relationship those real healthy boundaries kind of thing so um, I worked with a lot of project search sites and we created a curriculum of building healthy relationships at work and I think what What's working is before people would say, no, no, don't follow coworkers around. Don't do that. So sort of like, stop, stop. Rather than saying, wow, it looks like you're really interested in getting a partner or a sweetheart in your life. Let's talk about how you become a partner or a sweetheart with someone. And let's talk about all the different types of people in your life and who is it okay to be in a relationship with and who isn't it okay. So it's like validating that they're sexual beings, but we just can't act on it here when we're interns in the hospital. Um, so it's sort of balance. I think that that's one of the things we do is we just say, no, 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 rather than, well, what's the need underneath it? And how do we teach about how to do that in a healthy way? Um, so so we, have a, we wrote a curriculum and that's all over the country now as well. So some really good, projects. And so I'll do some training with project certs sometimes. And so I, I, like I said, we host trainings and then I do a lot of in-service and work with different groups. It's just amazing, Catherine. Just amazing. Thank you. I love that. Okay. I'm amazing. Oh, but it's so validating. I love that, you know, getting to the core of it. It just makes so much sense and it's it's such a beautiful way to transform that like love that really 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 beautiful thank you thank it's you not a, I, I, i'm not usually a crier okay <laughs> uh, this is like something's moving you something yeah it's hitting yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's just, it's really meaningful to me. Like I really appreciate this work and really appreciate what you're doing. And just, I love hearing these stories. You know, I just hear so many bad things all the time. It's so wonderful to like hear something so terrific that's happening. You know, it's yeah, it's absolutely wonderful. Yeah. How, what, so what advice for a parent who's, who's just learning about this, just starting to get involved, what sort of, trajectory would you advise them to go through in terms of your trainings and and learning about this and applying themselves and so forth yeah so um on our website we have a resource page and there's lots of articles and 
um, even some lessons that you could do with your own kid around different types of relationships, what's public and private. So there's a lot of content and resources on our webpage. So I think that might be a great place to start. Um, and I guess I would wonder too, like, I think it depends on the age of the child. You know, if they're young, then we're going to focus on more about body autonomy and body parts and using the correct terminology for body parts. And, and we do that because it normalizes the part, but it also gives them language to articulate if something does happen. Um, and I think it also makes them appear less vulnerable as well to have that language. So really important to use you know, medical terminology with our kids when we talk about their body parts. We wanna talk about privacy when they're young as well. Um, and I think also sometimes parents, including myself, mm -hmm. um, you know, when kids ask questions when they're really young, we think that if we tell them the truth, it's gonna shatter their innocence. Uh, and it doesn't, you know, because little kids want to know how babies are made and how does that all work? How did I get out? And then they want to know, wait, how did I get in? You know, um, <laughs> it's okay to answer that, right? I mean, it is absolutely okay. It will not harm them. Um, so I think those are sort of the topics to start off with um, young. And then we want to look at puberty, right? The bodies are changing and we want young people to know what's going to happen before it happens so that people aren't getting their period for the first time and thinking that they're dying or having a wet dream and thinking they have cancer or, you know, I mean, we want to make sure people know what to expect before. Um, and then it's lots, you know, that once they're in adolescence, it's a lot around relationships and, um, you know, how, how, what's a healthy relationship and, um, it's just, I mean, there's so many topics that I think it can be a little overwhelming for parents too. Um, like I've got to teach them about this and this and this and oh my God. Um, but I wanted to tell you too, that there is a, a couple of resources um, and I can gather a bunch of stuff together for you too. Um, one is uh, OAR, Organization for Autism Research. And it is, um, it's sex ed for self-advocates. So it's a really good um, resource, even for parents just to read it and learn. Um, because I, th it's, it, I think the, the resource itself is a little bit text heavy for some of the people that I work with. Um, even if they're readers, it's a lot of text. So even if a parent went through that with their child, you know, read parts with them and, or read it themselves to really just kind of start to hear what it sounds like, because I've had so many parents in my workshop say, can you just answer this question so I can hear what a healthy, normal conversation sounds like? Because we have no role models for that at all, right? We either don't talk about it or we joke about it. So how do you have a serious, healthy, like, what is it? They're like, what does that even sound like? I have no idea what that even sounds like. Hello. This is Auntie Catherine. Hi, Auntie Catherine. Hello. What's your name? Catherine is talking to mommy right now. Uh, mm -hmm. This is my daughter, Moxie. <laughs> Hi there, Moxie. What are you doing? I'm happy birthday. Oh, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Nice. The birthday video. OK, can you give mommy um, a few more minutes with Auntie. Mommy. Yes. I guess my birthday is. It's in late, but give mommy some more minutes with Auntie, okay? Okay. Do you want to go get an apple? Um, uh, it's snack time. Do you want an apple? Snack? Yeah, you can have an apple. Apple or yeah. six? Just apple. Okay. Hey, Micah, can you help Moxie get an apple, hon? What if I make lunch? Okay. So should I make like ramen? Okay. Okay. Do we do okay. Days? So where were we? We were talking about. Mommy, you said the yeah. days for my birthday? It's three months, honey. Three months until your birthday. Three months? Three months. <laughs> three months! 
Three months. Yes. Mine's three months too. So it's Micah, okay. <laughs> Mine's in three months too. What's that? Mine is in three months too. What day really? is her birthday? What's her birthday? What day? Moxie, when's your birthday? You want to tell Auntie? Yeah. When? May 7th. May 7th. I'm May 25th. Wow. Auntie is May too. You guys are both. I'm May as well. I'm May 10th. Oh, May 10th. Oh. Oh, Micah. And our, my first son, Micah, he's May 1st. Oh. May babies, yeah. Not, <laughs> not Mac. Not my third child. My third child is in October. Oh, okay. And is his name Max? Mac. Mac. Like the truck. Yeah. Or the nut or the turtle. Yeah. yeah. Okay, give mommy a minute with Auntie, okay? Okay, go with Micah. Okay, sweetie. What's that for lunch? Okay. <sighs> Okay. Can you go with Micah. You want to help Micah? Okay. Okay. So, obviously, this is extremely timely for me because she's 10. So, my daughter is 10. And she's just really starting to, you can say she's, she's, she's almost ready to be going through puberty. And it's really, I'm really, happy to be connecting with your trainings and with you in this moment and just have a, a guiding path you know in this yeah yeah um we also um i have this newsletter too that um when i worked at planned parenthood we wrote for parents of kids with developmental disabilities okay. and it has a bunch of different articles and it has a piece on sexual development and so um, that's also on our website as well. So it might be a great thing for you to just look at yourself and, and also to let other people in your blog know about. Um, yeah, so, so that's another resource. And then um, I also have a resource list that I give parents. So I'll send that to you as well. And um, yeah, so I think that those are sort of the resource ideas I have. And I think we were just talking about how when you get into adolescence, it can feel kind of overwhelming. So yeah, getting a newsletter, getting a few ideas, there's some tips for talking on the, on the website as well. Um, and so I think that was one of your questions too, is like, yeah. you know, sort of advice. And I, I think just, um, I think one of the things that I really like to reinforce with parents is, um, well, a couple things, well, probably more than a couple things, but um, to respond and not react, you know, so you get a question rather than having this reaction and thinking there's something, um, because I think our reactions cause a lot of shame. Um, so to just respond calmly, just if they're asking a question, it doesn't mean that, you know, bad things are happening or bad things will happen, but to really just respond and answer the question if you get asked a question. Um, and then I think the other piece, um, oh, I think I lost my train of thought, but definitely respond, don't react. Um, oh, I had another one, but I can't think of it at the moment. Um, <laughs> Come on. Come on. this happens to me all the time yeah. <laughs> i know it's gone when it comes to you at three in the morning <laughs> just stop with me <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly exactly um so respond don't react yes uh what else I think, you know, we sort of talked about this too, um, that body autonomy and helping young, young people have control of their lives as much as they can, you know, and I know as parents, we have to, you know, set the rules and enforce them and things like that. But, um, you know, parents will sometimes say like, 
but they need a bath. They just, they're, ooh. And I think, well, is it really the worst thing? Yeah. Is it really, you know, forcing yeah. a child, you know, and then, and you may have heard some of this stuff around like, um, when, when a, an adult is leaving that we don't make kids hug them, mm -hmm. um, you know, that yes. kind of thing. And, you know, yeah. so some of that body autonomy messaging, I think is really important early on. Um, I just think that's so extra, extra, extra important for kids with um, intellectual and developmental disabilities, as, you know, any disability really, but especially those because, you know, a lot of times they're in, um, some type of special ed program and so much pressure is on them constantly to change aspects of themselves you know for um you know some type of conformity to mainstream or in or in becoming more like people without disabilities than with mm -hmm. And I don't see spaces very often where they're really encouraged to to truly be themselves. Mm -hmm. so, right, right. Yeah. yeah. You can yeah. see that body autonomy piece starting that very early would be very, very important because they get so, so much pressure all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think the other thing that, you know, whenever I work with parents, we want to be askable and approachable. And um, so how do we convey that, that we're approachable and open? So actually yeah. this is kind of relevant. So Moxie yeah. has a, a friend who is a boy that she's certain she's gonna marry when she grows up. And oh. she's writing a letter to him and she is put she? it in the post box. And she wrote the letter, put it in an envelope, put a stamp on it and put it in the mailbox. And I saw the mailbox, but didn't have his address. Ooh. So we need to put his address on it. I did. You did? You did? Yeah. It says 22 what? Love? 22. Okay, we'll finish this later. Okay, mommy is still talking to auntie. So give me some minutes with auntie, okay? Oh. And then we'll put down his address, okay? I did. We finish doing this together, okay? Uh, okay. Give mommy a minute. Okay. I thought of it. I thought of it. What? I, what? Tell me what? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I always tell parents that um, if we don't teach healthy sexuality, someone else or the culture is going to teach unhealthy, right? So. If we want the culture to teach our kids what's okay and not okay, then don't talk about it. But most people don't want that, right? I mean, we want, so it's an opportunity to, to be open and askable and also insert your values and what you think is important too, versus the culture's values or, so that was the thing I forgot. Um, and that, yeah, we, I just don't think we need to lie to our kids. If they ask us a question, we should answer it. Um, if they're doing some sort of sexual behavior that we don't have the strong reaction, we just, you know, stop the behavior and find out, you know, why they're doing it and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so it's that being calm and open and, you know, you really, you're the primary sexuality educator of your child. And so if you're not talking about it, they're going to learn it from someone yeah. else. On that note, thank you so, so much for meeting with me. I really, really appreciate it, Catherine. You're welcome. I'll, I'll email you some links and things and a resource list and that art. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll give you a bunch of links on our website. And Can you stand for a minute? I'm just gonna stop the recording, but I, okay. I still wanna talk to you. Okay. Okay. Okay, sounds good.